Good morning. Welcome to Lyman Methodist Church Lakeside Campus. All who can and will, let's stand and sing together. morning. You can have a seat for just a minute. Welcome to the um, Lemon Lake 
Southside campus of Lyman Methodist Church. We are one church, three campuses, and um, we appreciate you being here today. Um, at the table to my left with the black tablecloth, we have contact cards if we don't have information on you, or if you want to get signed up for our electronic newsletter, please fill one of these out and drop it in the offering plate, or there's a box as you exit out the door. Prayer card, if you have any prayer concerns, please list those, and we will add them to our prayer list. If you are a visitor today, we have cards back there also that says, thank you for attending. And it tells a little bit about our church um, and has a QR code to take you to our social media. So if you are visiting, be sure and pick up one of those cards. Those that attend regularly, there's a card for you too. Take this, give it to a friend, neighbor. It says, please worship with us on Sundays at 1030. And it also has the QR code for social media on it. So um, make use of those on the back. Um, we're having a church-wide competition, and um, they announced that last week, and Operation Christmas Child, the shoeboxes are back there, there's a list of items that go in the shoeboxes, but the competition is, if we do the most boxes here per capita, then Pastor Andrew has to dress up like Santa Claus. So that's the motive to get it going, um, and we're doing it per capita so that the big campus downtown um, it, it even out so that they can't just beat us by numbers. So y'all can do it. So let's make Pastor Andrew dress up like Santa Claus. So I'm sure he's like, Ava needs to hush on that. Um, merchandise is still for sale through the middle of September. It's back there. We have t-shirts, polos, hats. If you haven't ordered your merchandise, please do so. Please include your money or check in the envelope back there. And if you did pay right out by your name that you paid so that I'm 100% sure that you paid because sometimes my money is not coming up even with what the orders say. So that would help me tremendously. Also, no, I'll get to that one in a minute, blood connection. If you can give blood, they will be at the church August the 29th, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. So if you are able to come during those hours and can give blood, please register and do so. That Blood is a critical item that the hospitals always need. It's life-saving. Plus, we have two members of Lyman Methodist Church that has to get blood fairly regularly, and that can go to credit to help them pay for those blood transfusions also. Centennial Memorial Bricks. It will be coming out in Lyman Lookout with a link to order your bricks. If you are not a computer person, there is a paper form at the back. Now, if you use that paper form, be sure you write legibly so that what you want on your brick is correct. Um, and attach your check to go with that. So, youth pool party. We got a full few youth here. Um, it's tonight, 4 to 6.30 p.m. Drop off at the downtown campus and then you will go up to the McIntyres who are very gracious to host that each summer. And I just have one more announcement, which is, um, which is a sad one. And in case you have not heard, um, we lost a gentleman from the Lake community who was very important to this campus and this church, um, Mr. Carlisle, yesterday. Um, he and Miss Jerry have been involved in this campus. Miss Jerry since the beginning, almost the beginning, because her parents... Um, initiated this. So just keep the Carlisle family in your prayers as they prepare to celebrate Mr. John's life. And it's um, going to be hard not seeing him coming in all the, all the time for late side because if he was able, he was here. So let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the saints that have carved our heritage, that has put for their time and talents into growing a service, into growing this service, God, that is now on its 57th year that began just as a summer offering to those vacationing on the lake. And wow, what you have done with it, God. And we know you are going to continue to grow it. 
So now, Father, just open our minds, our hearts, our ears to receive the prompting and the Holy Spirit and the message that you want us to receive here today. And I ask all of this in your precious name. Amen. Let's stand and sing one more time together. Merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and continue to worship. Let's give back to God our tithes and offerings. for hands 
answers far and wide but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide you know just what we Those for your time with Miss Ava. What you looking so scared for, Connor? I don't bite. Gosh, are y'all gonna sit? We're gonna sit. I'll pray for you, David. <laughs> Good morning. How are y'all? Good. All right. How do you get to heaven? you know how you get to heaven well yep you die but just dying doesn't automatically get you to heaven though does it what do we have to do as a believer in God you know what we have to do do all good people go to heaven if they're out doing good deeds and helping people all the time do all of them get to go to heaven do we just give them free ticket and say there you go Connor's saying no, and you, no, that's true. That's not how we all get to heaven. We are resurrection people with hope because Jesus died on the cross for us. And so when we repent of our sins and we invite Jesus into our hearts to be our savior and we grow each day, our work to grow each day to be more and more like Jesus, that's what gets us into heaven, right? All right. Now, y'all gonna help me lead the Apostles' Creed? Can you do that? All right, let's tell everybody, stand up so that we can profess what we believe as Christians because this is the beliefs that help us get into heaven, right? All right. Do you need to turn that way so you can see the words? Ready. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He had sent it into heaven and sit it at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From that she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Father, we just come to you today in prayer to lift up those that have lost loved ones, Father. Just be with them through the mourning and the grief. Let them feel your comfort and your strength to carry them through the days ahead. And Father, those that have had health challenges and those that are waiting test results, Father, just be with them. Give them peace and a calmness that is beyond their understanding when they're in the middle of that storm. Because, Father, we know that you will carry us. It is in our weakness that you are made strong. And I just pray your strength over those that are facing those challenges today. And Father, I just pray for this campus, Father. Let us grow to be open to sharing the gospel and being disciples to those around this lake and to those beyond this lake. I just pray that anybody that needs to hear your word, Father, will hear about Lakeside Campus and that they will come join us because, Father, it's a great place to be. And when we gather, your Holy Spirit is here with us. And we just give you all the praise and glory for all the blessings that you bestow upon us. And now, Father, let us pray together as your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, as Joanna is coming forward to read our first scripture, um, we have a guest speaker today, so that's probably a good thing. You're not going to have to listen to me today. Um, but we have with us Daniel Anderson, and it's a great pleasure to have Daniel and his family here. Um, I think he said he's been married about 15 years, and they have three great children. Um, but Daniel lives over in the Greer area, and he's um, been kind of a varied past as far as his up spiritual upbringing. He's been Pentecostal, charismatic. He's been a youth director. Um, he's been serving some way for God since 2002, although I told him he looked a little young to, for that length of time. But um, we are just great to have him here today, and he's currently um, in the process of becoming an Anglican priest. So we're going to welcome, welcome him with our warm late side welcome in just a few minutes as he brings our message today. Miss Joanne is going to bring our first scripture. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, what I have told you, I go 
to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Our second reading today comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, if you would like to follow along. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God who is rich in mercy, one of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the results of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be here with you. And you can say it's good to be here with me, too. That's okay. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Two people. Uh, we can talk after service today. Um, no, it is. It's really good to be here with you. Uh, I really appreciate uh, Miss e, Ava and, and her saying I don't look like I'm old enough. I just take that as a compliment because um, I'll be turning 45. Uh, and, you know, even though I may not look like it, I definitely feel like it. I mean, you know that you're progressing in age when, you know, when you're young, you do activities, you might hurt yourself. But then some days you wake up and you realize, I hurt myself sleeping. That's when you know. That's when you know that age is sneaking up on you. And so, man, that is a prayer request if you didn't realize that. So... Anyhow, uh, it has been my practice whenever I speak to, uh, to pray before sharing the Word of God. And, and I know that we've prayed at various times in this service, but how many of you know God has called us to be a people of prayer? Just as Christ is in heaven interceding on our behalf, we who are conformed into his likeness also pray for one another. Amen? So let us, I'm going to invite you, pray with me and pray for me as we dive into the Lord's word. So Heavenly Father, this morning we give you praise and honor and glory. We declare first and foremost that you are the king. You're a good God. You're a good father. You are love. And everything else that we know about you is conditioned by that truth that you love us that you died for us, that you rose again, and you invite us into your loving embrace. I pray this morning that your Holy Spirit would permeate this place. It would inspire the words of my mouth so that anything that is spoken would be your words and not my own. We entrust this service to you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I understand that we are in the midst of a series called The Bible Doesn't Say That. I like that. I like that. The Bible doesn't say that. And uh, 
Two weeks ago, uh, you guys jumped into a sermon titled, God Will Never Give You More Than You Can Handle. So the Bible doesn't say that he won't give you more than you can handle because in our weakness, his strength is made known. It's made perfect. It's perfected in our weakness. So God will all the time give us things that we can't handle because he can. And it causes us to run to him. Last week, uh, Christians don't judge. The Bible doesn't say that the Christian Christians don't judge. You will know them by their fruit. That is a form of judgment. We judge whether or not people's lives are producing the fruit that are in accordance with the character of Christ. And this morning, the title of the sermon is All Good People Go to Heaven. It's a nice thought, isn't it? All good people go to heaven. And this message, it permeates our culture, and I would say it even permeates our churches. I remember reading of an instance where a pastor was asked to perform a, a funeral service for someone who had no connection to his church and, to the pastor's knowledge, had no faith in Christ. And after the service, several members of the family came up to him and asked if he thought that the deceased would be in heaven. That is, that is a difficult place to be. I mean, they're standing outside right next to the grave and a family member who is mourning, knowing that this person never accepted Christ as their savior, asks them, or asks him, Will he be in heaven? The pastor takes a moment to think about it, and he says, and he politely responds, that the decision wasn't his to make, that it's God's. I thought, wow, that is a, that is a very political answer, right? That's like, you ask a question, but you don't really answer. And uh, one person in the family uh, became very angry at that response and proceeded to say, of course they'll be in heaven. They were a good person. They were a good person. Not only is it in our churches, I think it's embedded deeply within our own psyche. Because as we grow, even as children, we hear this message. How many of you remember that old Disney movie, All Dogs Go to Heaven? Do you guys remember that? It's about this dog named Charlie. Uh, he's not a good dog, but he dies, and this angel appears and, and it tells him, because all dogs are inherently good and loyal, they're entitled to go to heaven. Immediately, from childhood, I'm watching this movie and I think, all right, because dogs are good and cats are not. <laughs> And loyal, they must be going to heaven. What's interesting is, in order to get revenge, because poor Charlie was murdered, he sneaks back to earth. And in doing so, the angel shows up and says, oh, well, now you're going to go to hell. And I'm like, okay, wow. Because he did something wrong, now he's going to go to hell. Okay, so he's, he's good, he's going to go to heaven, he did something wrong, he's now going to go to hell, he can't make, his, make it back. And in the course of the movie, he begins to learn to do good things because he was a bad dog. And he ends up sacrificing his life to save a young girl. And the angel shows up again and says, you've earned your place back in heaven. What are we to do with this? I mean, we're being shaped and formed, even from the earliest ages, to think and to believe that all good people go to heaven, that all it takes is being a good person. And I was meditating on this sermon series. The Bible doesn't say that. And its relationship with the title for this sermon. And when we put them together, they really communicate the central idea shaping and forming this morning's sermon. The Bible doesn't say that all good people go to heaven. Being good people 
does not make us righteous people. The sermon this morning is telling us that doing good things don't open the door of heaven to us. No matter how good our actions or how good of a person we may seem to be, being a good person doesn't mean being a saved person. In the, in the reading of Scripture this morning, we see in Ephesians, Paul writes, all of us also lived among them, people living according to the flesh, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. By nature, deserving of wrath. Then skipping to verse 8, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved, verse 9, not by works, so that no one can boast. What is Scripture telling us this morning? That sin has corrupted our very nature. The nature of humanity, which was created in the image of God, was corrupted by sin. The image of God that we were created in has been marred. We have been, by the power of sin, bent out of shape so that even our good works are also bent. This is why in Isaiah chapter 64 we read, all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shriveled up like a leaf and like the wind, our sin sweeps us away. What is scripture trying to tell us here? That we are sinful in our nature so that even our good works are like dirty rags before God. Faithfully coming to church, financial generosity, fidelity in our marriages, acts of kindness, serving the poor, daily prayer, reading our Bibles every day, those are good things. They may even be great things. Good works, but they by themselves cannot make us righteous. In the light of God's holiness, they are as filthy rags. When I get up in the morning, to work out, which is admittedly not often. But sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I can do it. Sometimes, but, and I have to do it early. I have to get up early. So it's, it's dark outside. And I try to be kind to my wife. And I tiptoe around, trying to be as quiet as I can, which is not quiet at all, as she has lovingly told me. And I'm searching for a shirt. You know, and I'll find a shirt, and in the dim light of morning, I'm like looking at it, and I go, yeah, yeah, this is clean. And I'll put it on, and I'll go out, I drink my coffee, and then I'll go into the bathroom, and I look, and I, in the bright light of the bathroom, I realize my shirt is not clean. There are all kinds of dirt stains and stuff on it. This was a work shirt from Saturday when I was doing yard work. But in the dim light of the morning, it looked clean to me. Do you see where I'm going with this? That in the dim light of this earth, all our good works look superb. But in God's light, when he returns, they will be shown to be insufficient. They will not be good enough for heaven. And I want you to consider this. If being a good person were good enough, or if, be, if being a good person was good enough to be saved, then what need would we have for Christ? To believe that good works opens the door to heaven and to make good works necessary for others to be saved When we do that, we make nothing of the work of Christ in his incarnation. His suffering on the road to Golgotha, his death on the cross, his victory over the grave, his ascension over all things, they're emptied of meaning and worth. It's emptied of power because no longer is it Christ's work that brings us to God. It's our work. Why do we need Jesus? 
Which is why Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, Paul says, So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified, not by works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Later in verse 21, he continues, he says, For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. The main point of this message is this. That we could never be good enough to earn our way back into heaven. Salvation does not come to us through good works. So, that leaves us with two questions that I want to tackle in the last seven minutes that I have with you. Number one, what do? Okay, if that's not how we get to heaven, how do we get to heaven? What does Scripture say about salvation? And then the second question being, what does that mean for us today? Really quickly, the first one is apparent, that salvation comes by Christ and Christ alone. If it's not by good works that we're saved, if in fact we're utterly incapable of saving ourselves through our works, then we are in desperate and absolute need of someone with the power and the authority to save us, to heal us of the malady of sin, to ransom us from sin's power. And that person is Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in heaven, God incarnate. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to, Father, to the Father except through me. Acts chapter 4 verse 12, salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we can be saved. The second point is this, salvation is the free gift of God through Christ by the Holy Spirit. It's free. We don't work for it. Believing that humanity can earn salvation by good works Listen, it turns God into a kind of cosmic vending machine where salvation becomes a transaction. We put in the currency of good works and we're compensated with heaven. But scripture clearly says this is a free gift, not by works so that no one can boast. Then number three, the last two points I want to give to you is where I think really the meat of salvation as it is seen in Scripture comes alive. Bear with me because it might be a little shocking to our senses. What does Scripture say about salvation? Well, number three, salvation, it's not about going to heaven. I know we think that. Right? I mean, it's, I mean, what is salvation if it's not being saved to go to heaven? What does it mean? In John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus is praying just before his passion crucifixion. And he's praying to God and he says this. He says, now, this is eternal life. Okay, when he says eternal life, then we know he's talking about salvation. This is eternal life. That they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That they know you. Not know about you, but they know you. The Greek word there is gnosko, which means to perceive, observe, to obtain knowledge of insight into, and it denotes a personal, I love this, and true relation between the person knowing and the object being known. That is to say, to be influenced by one's knowledge of the object, to suffer oneself, to be determined thereby. 
What, what, let's just translate this into just everyday vernacular. It means knowing someone relationally. It's personal. And it's intimate. And it's so intimate that I cannot help be, but be changed by the object being known. So what eternal life is, what salvation is, is not going to heaven. It's knowing God so much that I'm transformed by him. This is not knowing about. You can know about something and not be changed by it. But Jesus is saying this is what eternal life is. Salvation, it's relational in its very nature and it speaks to being rescued by and for a mutually knowing relationship with the one who saves. This is why in, in the Old Testament, scripture would describe marital relations as knowing. As no, he knew her. He went in and knew her, and children came forth. We're not talking about he read a book about someone. We're talking about the deepest and most intimate act that humans can do. Knowing. That's the kind of knowing that changes us. That is salvation. And that leads me to the next point, the last one. Good works may not bring about salvation. I think, I, I think I've made that very clear. I think scripture is very clear. Works, they don't work. <laughs> we cannot earn salvation by good works, but neither can good works be separated from salvation. Can't be separated either. I don't, earn my, I don't earn a relationship with God because I do good things, but neither can we separate my life and the way I live it from my relationship with God. So in Matthew chapter 7, this is illustrated so clearly. Verses 21 through 23, Jesus is telling a parable, and he gives kind of the interpretation, and this is what he says, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Which, I know it sounds like Jesus is saying, oh, salvation's about going to heaven. But you have to imagine, understanding the relational nature of salvation transforms our understanding of what heaven even is. Heaven's just that space where we have relationship with God. So, so Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but this is what he says, but only one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Okay, wait a second. Didn't we just say that we don't earn our way into heaven? And here Jesus is saying, well, the only, only the one who works, does the works of my Father, gets into heaven. But hold up, verse 22 on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never... Anybody know? Can anybody guess? I never knew you. I never knew you. It's the same word. Gnosko. Speaking to relational salvation. I never knew you. So Jesus is connecting here the dots for us. That yes, if we know God relationally, that is the essence of salvation. But the very essence of salvation transforms us so that we do the will of the Father. Let me say it this way. Those who believe but do not do the will of the Father, that is good works, and those who did good works but did not know him, do not enter the kingdom of God because Jesus says, I never knew you. I never knew you. Guys, your salvation, this is the thing. We think salvation is a one-time deal. Jesus just speaks and we're done, we're saved. And now I can go about my merry way and live my life any way I like. 
But imagine, just imagine this with me. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I love that. You know why? Because when he says that I am the way, this is what he's saying. I am the way as in you can only through me come to God. By relationship with me, you have relationship with God, right? But it also means I am the way and the truth of life. The way of life. Look to me and you know what it is to live the Christian life. It's the way. I am the way. A way of living life. So again, all of a sudden together, together, we can't, listen, we can't say that I'm a Christian and then live life just any, way, any old way we please. It changes us. Okay. I know I'm two minutes over, but I'm, I'm wrapping this up. Looking back to that word, gnosko, I never knew you. The last part of that definition says this. That is to say to be influenced by one's knowledge of the object. It's to be influenced by God. To suffer oneself to be determined thereby. To suffer. I love the question you asked the kids this morning. You said, how do we get to heaven? And what was the first answer? You die, <laughs> right? And, and here's the thing. From the mouth of babes. Because here's the truth. We want to say, oh, Jesus died and saved us so that we don't have to die. But that's not the truth. Jesus died so that we can die with him being crucified with Christ. Unless you take up your cross and follow me, you have no part. It's being so close to Jesus, so relationally tied to him that we are crucified with him and buried so that we can also be raised with him to new life. And that new life exemplifies good works. Philippians chapter 2 says, Therefore, beloved, just as you have always loved me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence. That's not Jesus, that's Paul. He says, Paul says, Work out your salvation with much fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you to both will and work for his good pleasure. So we work out our salvation so that God can work his salvation in us. We work it out in our lives as he works it in us. We know him and we're changed by him. I want to leave you with this image. It's an easy way to think about this. Salvation is like receiving necessary and life-saving surgery. We're helpless to save ourselves in the face of our life-threatening condition. It's a condition that requires the work that only a surgical doctor can do. So what do we do? We call and schedule the appointment, and when the time comes, we get in the car, we drive to the hospital, we lie down, and we trust the doctor to do what only the doctor can do. See, our good works cannot save us. Sin is a disease that, the, that only the good doctor can take care of. But those good works, listen, those good works like praying and serving the poor, Listen, they don't cure us of sin. But you know what they do? They create the conditions by which God can now come and work in me. God working in you to will and to do good works. So how do we apply this? You cling to God's free work of salvation. Cling to it daily, I learned that the ancient church, not too long ago, every Sunday that they would meet, 
was, was Resurrection Sunday. They were celebrating the resurrection. When we gather, it's, we're celebrating Resurrection Sunday. Not just Easter Sunday, but every time we gather, we're a resurrection people. Cling to the work of salvation. That relates, cling, cling to God. That's what I'm saying. Allow your good works to be a place of receiving God's work in you so that it can produce more good works that flow out of you. As we do, we are reformed into the image of Christ. Participating in his divine, in his divine nature is what Peter says. And in that, we become his body, the body of Christ. When the world sees us, they should see Christ. The church is called the body of Christ. We are his hands. We are his feet. We are the ones in this world. When the world sees us, they should see Christ. When they look upon our good works, they should not see our good works. They should see the work of Christ in and for them. Amen? Here's my invitation to you. For the next few moments, we're going to worship the Lord. This whole message is about reminding us of this one truth. Christ saves us when we cannot save ourselves. And he enables us. He enables us by the power of his spirit to do good works, which only opens the door further for deeper relationship with God. Let us meditate on that as we worship him this morning with our final song. All who can and will, let's stand one more time and sing In Christ Alone. Yes. 
forth from this place. I want to bless you to go forth in his love, knowing that salvation is all about being close to him. And that will change you so that you can be Christ to the world. Now let me pray this benediction over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I pray that he remain with you now and always continuing his work in you and enabling you to will and to work for his good pleasure. In the name of Jesus Christ, we all said, Amen. Thank you for allowing me to be here with you today. And I, man, I consider it a great pleasure. And I know that God is working in us all. Amen. 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 I'll see you next time. I don't know when that is. So. <laughs>